Hebrew scripture today will be read from the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing, establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my vow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. The epistle reading today will be from the first chapter, from the first book of John, chapters 1, verses 5 through 10, and chapters 2, verses 1 and 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of God for the people of God. of John chapter 21 verses 15 through 19. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow older, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. When Simon Peter encounters this resurrected Jesus, Jesus gives him a second chance. You know, Peter denied knowing Jesus three times during the difficult hours of Jesus' so-called trial. You can read about those denials in John chapter 18, seven, verse 17, 25, and 27. He might have denied Jesus three times. This had to have been probably uh, one of Peter's darkest times as a disciple when he denied Jesus those three times. And when he saw the resurrected Jesus on the beach, as it's described there in John 21, these denials were surely on his mind. You know, he no doubt was filled with guilt for his failure to be faithful when the going got tough. 
in Pilate's court. Left with the guilt that he has unresolved, it would have been difficult for Peter to have been able to lead the disciples in the proclamation of the gospel and the miracle of salvation that Jesus had brought about because of his life, death, and resurrection. He would have been preoccupied with his own failure. Jesus asked Simon Peter three times, do you love me? Three times Simon Peter responds that he loves the Lord. Jesus gave Simon Peter a second chance. He was no longer the failure that denied Jesus three times in Pilate's court. He was now a disciple of the resurrected Christ who had affirmed his love and faithfulness to God three times. In each of the responses that Simon Peter makes, Jesus offers him a tangible way to make his love that he's proclaiming real. And each of those times, he primarily says, feed my sheep. Not only does Jesus give Simon Peter a second chance, he gives that second chance a great purpose and meaning in Simon Peter's life, in the lives of other people, and most importantly, in God's plan of salvation for the world. Our God is a God of second chances. You know, that's really what Easter is about. That's really what the good news is all about, is that our God is a God of second chances and newness of life. God has made second chances possible through Jesus' victory over sin on the cross. When, he, when we stumble and when we fall, our God offers us a hand up. Our past failures do not define our future. When we say yes to Jesus, God offers us a new chance and a new life. Our new life is not about repeating the past. It's about having purpose and meaning in our lives, in the lives of others, and also in God's plan of salvation for the world. The Christian question is, do you need a second chance? If so, say yes to Jesus, because he gives us second chances and newness of life. You know, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this is a difficult teaching, friends. Jesus makes this statement after teaching about prayer and giving us what we call the Lord's Prayer in verses 9 through 13. This is a challenging teaching that we affirm every time we say the Lord's Prayer. Do you remember? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If one uses the words debts or sins, you know, if there are any Baptists or Presbyterians here, it means exactly the same thing, doesn't it? Now, I don't know about you, but I would rather not have my forgiving others tied to my being forgiven by God. I need and I want to have my trespasses forgiven, but forgiving others who have trespassed against me is a whole different matter. Well, not according to Jesus. He says the two are interconnected. And Jesus reinforces this in Matthew 7, 1 and 2, when he teaches about judging others. Do you remember this? Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. The truth is that when God offers one a second chance through the forgiveness of sins, one's resentment of others can be a barrier to stepping into the new future that God calls us into. When Jesus gave Simon Peter a second chance, he also gave him a new purpose, you know, Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my people. When Peter entered into the new life that comes with saying yes to Jesus' offer of grace, it challenged him not only to leave behind his failure, but also to leave behind anything that would keep him from becoming a new creation or a new creature that that redemption of grace brings. The same with us. You know, the late Nelson Mandela said in this in a powerful way. Uh, they asked Nelson Mandela about how he was able to work with the same people that were connected to apartheid 
who were responsible for sending him unjustly to prison for many years. He worked with those very people to do away with apartheid and to establish uh, the democracy that South Africa now has. And this is what Nelson Mandela said in response to the question. He said, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemy. Now, I want to say that again because that's an important thought, friends, when it comes to forgiveness. He said, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemy. This could be why Jesus teaches us that realizing forgiveness, realizing a second chance, entering into newness of life that God's grace offers requires us to empty the cup of resentment that we sometimes hold so tightly and drink from so deeply. Drinking from that cup of resentment poisons our opportunity for new life. This is not an easy teaching. How difficult it must have been for Jesus when he looked down from the agony of the cross upon those who placed him there and said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. Forgiveness of others can only be realized by the same power of God's grace that forgives our sin. You only wish that that was me. I'm kidding. Thank you for the amen. Indeed. Have you seen this in real time? Have you experienced forgiveness, newness of life, second chances in, in real time? I hope so. That's what it's all about, is us experiencing second chances and newness of life. If you've lost someone you've loved recently and you have a service of Christian death and resurrection, you know what experiencing the hope of second chances and newness of life is because that's what eternal life and resurrection from the dead is all about. It's God's ultimate offering of new chances and newness of life. But I want to tell you a story that just lives in my heart because I'll be honest with you, second chances and new life wasn't completely real to me until what happened in this story happened. In the church that I served, there was a, a, a wonderful and brilliant young woman in her early 30s. She was married to a wonderful man who was well-respected in the community, and she had two uh, little girls that were just, just beautiful and wonderful. And... Uh, this young woman uh, and her girls participated uh, regularly in the church. They were very, very important to the church family. And it became even more so when one day, I'm going to call her uh, uh, Susan, uh, came into my office with tears in her eyes. And she, she said to me, Pastor, she said, I've been diagnosed with esophageal cancer. And... Uh, Oh, we lifted her up in church. We prayed for her. Uh, some of us went to Houston to MD Anderson when she had her gastric pull-up surgery. We surrounded her with the greatest of love and the greatest of care, and there was just a community outpouring of concern and help and a lifting up in that. And, and she became cancer-free, and she still is to this day, I believe unless something's happened since I last knew. And that took about two years, that process. And Susan came back in my office one day with those big tears in her eyes. And when I looked at her, I thought, oh, no, it's back. And I says, is it, is it the cancer? And she shook her head, no. She uh, was employed by the city as the city treasurer. And she was the one responsible for collecting the money, the cash money and the check money. She said, Lou, I've embezzled about $40,000 from the city. Wow. About knocking up. She said, you're the first one that I'm telling but she said, the audit is going to show. And she said, I know that 
the consequences are coming. And she said, I just need your help, your support. And that very night was the city council meeting, and I went with her. And, of course, she fessed up to her sin, that she had stolen the money. She was very, very remorseful. Uh, she, she pledged to pay it back. But, of course, on something like that, it's a criminal act. And so it doesn't just go with paying it back. They're, they're, you know, things start happening. And they did for her. And uh, a trial and different things like that. It, I mean, it wasn't a jury trial or anything because she knew, she knew what she'd done and she fessed up to it. And so they, they made a sentence. She had to serve time in jail. And she was supposed to make restitution for the money. And she was looking for ways to... Uh, to raise that money. Now, I want to go back to church because Sunday came, you see, after Wednesday. And I told Susan, I said, Susan, I said, I want you to come to church. She said, I just could not do it, Lou. She said, I couldn't. And I said, I sure would want you to. I said, come. I said, sit right in the front row. Oh, she said, there are going to be so many people angry with me. Well, she didn't come that Sunday, but I kept working on her. But boy, people were sure talking about it, don't you know? They were really talking about it. In fact, I had a lady come to my office. I'm going to call her Barbara. Now, Barbara was one of the older ladies, a very a matriarch in the church, you know. And she came to my office after the first Sunday that Sam is a excuse me, Susan was there, and uh, that day uh, when Susan was there, you know, uh, we never said anything, I just, I just wanted her to be there, I said, you can't, you can't just back away from your church, and I said, I don't think your church wants, wants that, there were a lot of people that gathered around her that day and, and showed her some support, Barbara came into my office, and boy, I tell you what, Barbara was in mean mode. And she said, if that woman ever comes back into this church again, she said, I will not ever be in this church again. And she shook her finger at me when she said that. And I said, Barbara, have you ever read the account of the woman caught in adultery in the Gospel of John? And she didn't really care about that. Well, I said, you know, if you have to be perfect, if you have to be without sin to come to this church, I won't be here next Sunday either. And so I said, you're going to have to make this, this decision on your own. Because I said, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that Susan is back there in that pew with those little girls. Because I'm going to support her. I don't support what she did, but I said... She's confessed, she's making restitution, she's looking for forgiveness. Well, Barbara didn't leave. She kept coming, she kept coming, you know, and we kept working on this stuff, and there was a lot of support for Susan. I mean, this, I was afraid her cancer would come back, is what I was afraid. She was under a lots and lots of stress. She'd done a terrible thing. She had betrayed the people that, that trusted her so much. There were even people that tried to go. She was serving her time on the weekends, okay? They'd let her out in time to go to church. She'd go in there on Friday, but then she could be mom in, uh, during the week to her girls. So there were people helping with the girls, but there were even people that said, could I go and serve time for her? <laughs> Isn't that something? Yeah. But anyway, things, you know, started healing a little bit. The first Easter after this happened came around and we sang Hosanna and stood on Palm Sunday and talked about forgiveness. Then the second year, this was in the second year, I told, Sam, I told Susan, I said, we're going to do something special this Easter. I said, Easter has traditionally been a time when people that have been uh, for one reason or another, cut off from community. 
that was a time when they would be brought back in and included then in a, in a, in a, in a public way, reunited in the community as a whole person and a full member. Because you see, she had been off to the side in her own mind and in the mind of a lot of people. So I said, this Easter, that's going to be the focus of our Easter message, is I said, I want you to come to the front of the church. And we're going to talk about your guilt, your repentance, your punishment, but most of all about forgiveness. So I had this all figured out, you see, <laughs> that it was going to be such a powerful, powerful service because of what the preacher was going to say about all this stuff. Well, Susan came up, and I started talking, and clear to the back, Barbara stood up. My heart just went, boom, you know what I'm talking about. And here she came, and I could tell she was coming with purpose. And I thought, she's going to foil this because she's going to make she's going to show herself right here on Easter Sunday. And she came and walked up to Susan. And she put her arms around her. And she wept. And she said, I love you. And I forgive you. And will you forgive me? Friends, this stuff is real. I would just leave the question with you. Where is it real? Where does it need to be real in your life this day?